Hello, good morning. Welcome to our Insta talk. We just wait for our guest. I'm sure he will be here in a few of the seconds. And then we will start our short interview. Tension is rising. Just waiting for Daniel Wetzel from Rimini Protocol. And yes, for now we should just wait. Hope you are doing all fine. Hope you are safe and yes, enjoy the the wonderful weather you are having. Hopefully, just a little small talk before we start our interview, before our guest arrives. So maybe before I can tell you if you have questions, just comment them, I will write them down later and we will have a quick section at the end where we will ask and answer the questions you had. Okay, for the moment, Daniel is not here. I will just call him if he or send him a message. Okay, there he is. So. Say hello to Daniel Rimini Wetzel. He just arrived and will join me. Yes, here he is. Okay, so we're waiting and then we can. Yes, hello. Daniel. Hello, Servus. hello, Daniel. I'll listen. So now we can start officially. Welcome to our Insta Talk. I'm Fabian Müller, Head of Collection of Art and Cultural History till 1918. And I'm glad to not only welcome all the visitors, but especially our guest, Daniel Wetzel from Rimini Protocol. We are talking today a little bit because yesterday I made a small guided tour through Win Win, an installation by Rimini Protocol currently being shown at the Schloss Museum Linz. If you have not watched that video already, you're kindly invited to do so at our Instagram. But before we talk about this installation, Daniel, please tell us a little bit about you, about Rimini Protocol and your style of work. Okay, so um, <clears throat> uh, I'm based in Berlin as a uh, theater artist um, together with Helgard and Stefan. They're also based here and we founded this collective of three authors, directors, developers of formats about 20 years ago, a bit longer. It's our 20th anniversary this year. And um, one of the things that we discovered uh, early when we started to work uh, is that we felt that theater as such is one of the greatest media ever because it still provides us to good reasons to um, come together and to, or to meet in some sort of ways that can be reinvented um, again and again. Uh, 
Um, and on the other hand, we felt strongly that uh, the standard operational system, so to speak, or philosophy of theater, uh, that hasn't much changed since centuries, um, could get like an update or at least alternative systems could uh, attach to this, sort of with theater in, in our minds, but what means theater today? The way we're meeting uh, today, <clears throat> it's my first Insta talk, by the way, uh, <laughs> is just another option. And every, it's another OS, so to speak, for our meeting. And every uh, new OS provides other chances to uh, communicate and uh, to make other experiences with basically how we see things. But also, and that's a third component, uh, a third thing that we discovered, that uh, what is outside the arts seems to be at least as interesting than what's inside. So um, what's outside, in, in our case, um, as theater, people who start from, we started from theater and installation and arts, but uh, what's outside drama um, is the more interesting piece for us. And that is since actually since 30 years. So instead of reading a drama, we'd rather go to a court and listen. Um, instead of reading a book about something, we'd rather also, at a very early stage, contact experts that would have written books and speak with them about it. So the performance of knowledge and the performance of expertise is something that um, we find uh, very important because it includes not just information, it includes the very, very important act of careful listening and it 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 uh, binds uh, knowledge and thoughts um to biographies and experience it's sort of an embodiment of um <clears throat> of knowledge and of curiosity which always includes that people approach each other if i listen to that person and uh, fourthly that's most interesting if you speak with people or listen to people who you would otherwise never have met or spoken to which, fifthly, includes perhaps also uh, that it can provide the possibility uh, to reach out to people who you actually, well, really have problems to understand initially. So it's the, the further you kind of reach out of your bubble or crack it. or So every contact outside uh, this field <clears throat> of comfort um, where what you, the people think around you is sort of the same and the interests are sort of the same and, uh, and so on, um, to, to reach out and, and ask somebody uh, outside uh, there, out of this, uh, if I speak now in terms of space, um, uh, that's always very, very um, uh, disturbing in a, in a po positive way. So this is our approach, and we did a lot of pieces with what we call experts of everyday life, although many experts then come with experiences that don't have to do with our everyday life. They just refer to it. And we put them on stage. We were interested in what do these people have to say also to each other. And um, we always insisted that this is professional theater. It's not amateur theater because the people on stage are experts for in their own kinds. And fortunately, not for acting, which provides them with the big joker and plus that you believe them, which is hard uh, when you watch actors. You can't believe them. You just observe how they pretend and you observe them in their arts and you observe them with the intensity that they also manage to seduce you to follow emotions that they don't have to perform. All these experts can't really do. They could perhaps tell a lie, but uh, and then you would believe them because they said before they're an expert for this thing. But otherwise, it's more the authentic uh, um, that is the material in, in, in our work. So the authentic in the, in the audience, in the actors, and in the theme as, as a whole. So it's kind of a yeah, forced togetherness for people to experience other people and other realities through the act of Discussing, presenting. presenting dialogue, um, to get a little bit in in the direction of the Schloss Museum, this togetherness, this dialogue is in your in your past uh, project, if I overview them correctly, between humans and other humans, and now we have a different kind of dialogue because uh, humans are corresponding with jellyfish 
So what's the... Uh, right. What's, so that's, yeah. What's the main idea between uh, yeah, putting animals on one side for confronting uh, humans with uh, this, yeah, this uh, kind of existent existential questions and this groundbreaking uh, matter? Well, I mean, in a way, you're listening to humans because you're, uh, we, you will hear a lot about, you're hearing a lot about what we know or some of what we know about these species that hasn't actually adapted much change uh, during the recent millions of years. And at the same time, it's speculating uh, about... Um, how we will adapt and change in the following, let's say, centuries, so much a shorter time span. Um, it was the first time that we've been working uh, exclusively for an, uh, and in an exhibition, and the framework was, the, was an exhibition about um, <clears throat> the world after the Anthropocene, so the world after the humans was sort of the title of the um, uh, exhibition in Barcelona. And... Um, Uh, we actually started off uh, with just working with an exhibit. Just uh, we, we thought, let's not do theater. Let's let's enjoy that. We can work in an exhibition. But what uh, happened then turned out to be the result is a hyper theatrical experiment for and with uh, these spectators. Uh, meanwhile, looking at um, jellyfish uh, that we that it's just this is something between plants and animals. It is. You're sort of looking really at life. There's a pulsation. Apparently, it has to do with nutrition. Apparently, nutrition has to do with movement, and movement has to do with energy, which uh, needs uh, nutrition. And that's apparently about it. And uh, it is in a in a special uh, liquid solution, like a water with uh, special salts, because they're not in nature. Um, apparently, this is where we come from. Uh, on a very rooted, deeply rooted uh, understanding of existence, we still know that. And um, so it's it's like you look at this phenomena uh, at the other end of life, so to speak, from our point of view, about which we learn that uh, they won't have a problem with a lot of the catastrophes that we're causing and just live on, you know. <clears throat> Everything that's bad for us is good for them and they're quite the contrast to us is really physiology, the, the nerving system, yeah. and so on. And yeah. So uh, one, one thing that uh, always disturbs me in, as a theatre maker in museums is I can't have control over the time consumption of the visitor. That makes me really nervous. When, I, when I'm in museums, I very often uh, like to observe the pace with which people... Um, go through the same exhibition and I understand, okay, every piece of art or every thing that you can see has about, a, like humans, a chance of some seconds uh, until people have decided I like it or I don't and then they continue. And like with humans, same thing happens with the pieces in the museum. They would actually deserve otherwise. You know, they would learn, le but there's so many. So yeah. as theater makers, we didn't intend that, but it turned out that uh, we did what the regular job, what we're always liking to do, we would like to guide your and, uh, perception and seduce you to follow a certain amount of thoughts, not because we want to manipulate, but we want you to make an experience that is only possible through um, kind of investing perception and investing thoughts and also, let's say, gestures and things like that, not to uh, spoil too much, but um, uh, yeah, just, uh, it's, 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 it, it turned out to be um, quite a theatrical piece because I think experience is the thing that um, changes your thinking. And, and it's uh, also another Ex kind of uh, interaction with the, with the topic. Like you said, visitors going through a museum and uh, every piece has a couple of seconds, but everything is on a, on a same level. And we uh, we put them in this erratic senses to uh, um, to put some idealistic uh, meaning in them, and so all the people go to uh, the Mona Lisa or the C Sixteen Madonna, and because someone put more in it than it should be, or that uh, or uh, assuming that the others should be less. So this is kind of interesting for museum people also 
how we can work with uh, artworks that are on this higher pedestal of erratic sense and uh, what are not. And uh, in the result, everything talks the same. Everything talks about reality of life and little facets of every day's life. So that could be a huge uh, point of discussion. But um, I want to go in another direction with you because uh, the second lockdown is here. Mm -hmm. The museum, theaters, uh, as well as many other cultural institutions are closed again and are, okay, um, I hope my question didn't, uh, didn't uh, push him away. I really hope he comes back because it would be quite interesting to get the answer. I will ask the question again, not, uh, not complete yet. When, uh, okay, he's back. So we are just, here. Okay. I am again. It's yes, uh, Fred perfect. Internet here, an expert. <laughs> perfect. Um, Perfect for the tension yet. Um, okay, as I said, a second lockdown, all the cultural institutions are closed again um, and needs to find uh, new solutions in a time of uh, this distancing, the necessary distancing and the digital possibilities, all the new fancy stuff that it's now uh, possible. What are in your eyes, uh, especially chances for theaters, for museums, for the cultural institutions as a whole, but for your um, work and for Rimini Protocol, especially uh, reacting to this matter, or do you do it already? Well, uh, the um, f first uh, reaction, of course, was uh, doing digital works um, straight away. Uh, we we, we um, had 38 cancellations in the first lockdown. That means 38 different cities um, mainly in Europe, uh, where we were supposed to come with um, tour touring a piece or having an opening, uh, developing something new. So that was pretty harsh. Um, but um, so they all had been postponed, some cancelled. And OK, uh, on the other hand, uh, arts or let's, we, we never speak about arts. Actually, we speak about work and projects. Um, art is never an argument for us. Um, uh, the work always uh, refers to the world. Uh, and for us, for me, it felt like a very interesting concept. Uh, you know, I would have loved to re read a book about it uh, if everything shuts down and on the level of social um, contacts and uh, consumation and uh, consumption and so forth. Um, that was very interesting. For my understanding, the first lockdown should have been, but this is really very me, and, um, and I don't want to say anything about that it should have been for others, but for me personally, it would have been very interesting if the first lockdown would still continue to really see how do we uh, approach very, very important issues um, because we can't step out of this. So we risk the death of some thousands of people in every country, uh, more or less, so that everybody can go on holidays and kids back to school. That's perhaps very important. But what was at stake and what still is at stake, both in the economy as well as in, um, like in how does society work economically, as well as um, when you think of climate change and uh, so forth, I think lockdown number one should still be on uh, because we ha would have another debate. For us as artists, uh, it is about... Um, understanding what happens and to react on it uh, with formats that are possible. So, of course, there was um, straight away, we did uh, seminars that would result in little performances, not super public, you know, only for a few people, 70 people, 80 people, may maybe sometimes 100 that would follow in one Jitsit or Zoom or so, and we would just work with uh, people that are also online globally. I had, um, like, workshops where we really, really people from Brazil and from uh, Spain, with a big, very big uh, time span difference, um, would perform together. You know, you would meet four or five times, prepare something, everybody does a 10 minutes thing, and, and it comes from different continents, but on the same platform. And so it's, it's very much about, it has been very much about uh, not only what are you expert for, 
because of eventually most of the people had to do with arts in some sense, but where they are, what are the different viewpoints on the same thing, not only on COVID, on, on specific themes that we would then uh, identify. This goes on. I'm teaching in um, Abu Dhabi at the moment. Uh, that means I'm rehearsing and working with students that they are based in Abu Dhabi, but again, sitting in Romania, in, um, yes, in the Air Emirates, uh, in India, um, in Poland. You know, so it's a total different mode of meeting and working with very heavy restrictions. Every two, three weeks, a new feature pops up on these uh, platforms that you can use. And we are apparently just in the beginning of learning um, uh, and developing for yet a completely different operational system of perception and communication. And theater is always there where perception and communication happens. So we, we might make buildings for this, uh, like it was done in the um, <clears throat> 17th, 16th century, that we built a theater for theater. But apparently that's not so important anymore. We can do theater on Zoom. We can do this theater on Skype. We can do this theater here because it's more of a, a mode of another way of wanting to approach and understand what's going on and to be in touch with people that are not on our surface eventually, uh, normally on a standard level. So that's what it's about. And um, so that's why I, I enjoy it very much, uh, the, uh, the effort uh, that you have to make just to understand uh, how can we be together and uh, be just in another mode of thinking and um, exchange uh, than we've been used before. Let's not talk about money because this is, of course, a big uh, problem for many artists that uh, and, uh, have developed their formats in a way that they perhaps not that easily go digital straight away. But um, so these were chances that we saw. And um, on the other hand, I have to admit that uh, especially working for museums is something that, or with museums is something that we found very interesting Follow this, uh, following this first uh, work for a museum that you're presenting. And uh, we're preparing two pieces that are actually um, also for the White Cube. And there we're also betting that next summer it's all going to be different, uh, which is perhaps, you know, perhaps a mistake. Uh, or we then have to see uh, mm -hmm. what we do with it. Yeah, but uh, it's interesting how, uh, how topics come up now when it's uh, absolutely necessary. That could also uh, have been come up in the, in the spring last year, two years ago. But now it's kind of a shifting of a focus uh, to new new styles of dialogue, new styles of interaction and interfering. And also, uh, like you said, this, necess this, uh, is this uh, forced distancing creates new, um, new connections through ways that were already opened but now they have to be used. And so everything is making in a kind of a way a good out of a bad thing and proposing new ways of dialogue, to testing it out. And so uh, it's interesting that you uh, said uh, the major point for you is the dialogue, the, the um, understanding of the, uh, the other ones uh, through talking, through meeting, uh, be it... Uh, Uh, via social media or directly. And that's also what museums uh, should do uh, even more than they have in the, in the past. And so uh, this is uh, maybe the, yeah, the light at the horizon for uh, both of us, for both of our um, hometown institutions to say so, um, that now there is a more, more, um, focus on the dialogue narratives that should be uh, even more in the front. As yeah, apparently the, discoveries, the apparently discoveries are really key that we discover um, chances and, uh, but I mean, this always when you discover something, it is something, it is a moment of interest and interest in the basic sense of the word means between, to be between. Uh, inter esse that means uh, I am entering a, a sphere in which I want to I can make another experience which is kind of the basis for a communication that wants to lead somewhere yeah and, and I'm, uh, I'm between yeah things yes I'm, inter esse yes. interest interest 
Yeah. So that's why uh, museums are interesting places <laughs> because <laughs> these these things are also in the state of being in between. There, when they're also jellyfish. I mean, the first experience that I made with a jellyfish, I guess outside uh, this, uh, perhaps before in the sea, but uh, was uh, in Berlin, I think, in that zoo. That where 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 in the um, there there is one person who made it his. They started at some point some uh, 20 years ago to try to breed jellyfish outside the sea. So that was like, it's, it's rather young knowledge. And um, that they were experimenting and they were like an internet of uh, <clears throat> experts all over the world that they tried to make this possible uh, on the level of zoos. Perhaps um, for, for restaurants and so on, there have been already some business people who knew how that works. And... Um, and I was wondering, there's this one, you know, uh, jellyfish in a, in a basin, rather small, that is just floating, but it can't move because it's too small. And there's some, you know, some, there's uh, air being pushed up uh, in the water, pressure from down so that it stands. And you stand, all the fish in this aquarium are moving, just this thing just stands. And I was wondering whether they switch it off, you know, or put reduce the pressure for the night or what. Uh, if the jellyfish lies on the ground, if we are not there. And apparently not, it would not be good for this uh, creature. But they're sort of just there, and they're not waiting for us to look at them. But they're between where they normally would be and us. So that's why museums and paintings the same. They're all, most of them that I find interesting are not made for the museum, but they're made for places, uh, or many that I find that we find interesting. And suddenly they are in between their original, in, uh, you know. And we were uh, listening to a discussion uh, last week um, from um, from the uh, Leibniz organization, which is a, a big um, network of um, scientific museums and uh, scientific. Uh, science labs um, dealing with history, but also with um, nature science and uh, so on. And one of the scientists said, every piece of dirt is interesting because if we, we I found a box with dirt from 40 years ago. We, they didn't know what to do with it. It was actually dirt. It was random that they kept it. But now we can learn so much from this piece of dirt. It's very interesting. So it sort of was waiting for the new approaches and technologies that we have now to understand more about this piece of, piece of earth. <clears throat> and I think the same go goes for artworks uh, that are in your museum. I think there is no better thing to close our, our quick talk like that uh, sentence of yours that uh, puts the whole in one, I think. So... Thank you so much, Daniel, for this great talk and for your wonderful work. Thank you for listening. Yeah, thank and you for all. asking. Yeah. Thank you for the <laughs> interest. For... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it goes on and on. Yeah. So uh, thank you again, Daniel. Thank you all for joining us today. Stay tuned for more interviews, for more talks and tours on our social media. And especially stay safe and have a wonderful weekend. So... Bye, Daniel. Bye, you all. See you. Have a wonderful weekend.